So welcome back from the short break. Our next uh, panelist in uh, the morning session is uh, Vera Bühlmann with her paper Meteora Alloys, Sealess Ideations and their Architectonic Space of Extension. And even though Vera is probably very well known to every one of you, I would like to take the chance to shortly introduce her. Vera Bühlmann is Professor of Architecture Theory at Vienna University of Technology and Director of the ATTP Department since 2016. She originally studied English Literature and Language, Philosophy and Media Studies at Zurich University and earned a PhD in Media Philosophy, Philosophy of Techniques from Basel University in 2009. Together with Ludger Hovestadt, she is co-founder of the Applied Virtuality Lab in 2010 at the Chair for Computer-Aided Architectural Design at ETH Zurich where she had been teaching since 2008. And she is co-editor of the Applied Virtuality book series, to which I want to invite you to have a look. You all have this in our, pros in our brochure. This is our latest uh, book out of this series. So now to you, Vera. <laughs> Thank you, Georg. Thank you all for being here. It has been wonderful days, and I'm very excited to now say what I have to say. I'm a bit, um, I was a bit at a loss with this clumsy title. It's very long. Um, I was trying to think about, with sealess, sealess ideations, I was trying to think about a kind of an imagination that works geometrically upon structure. Yeah? So an imagination or a relation to pictures that is not content related and that is also not a structuralist, yeah? but it's engaging with structure. And I came to this word, word sealess, um, like I usually do with the words that become important. So it somehow jumped at me and I didn't know it. And then I realized that I don't really like it. <laughs> so there is jealousy in it. Um, at the same time, and but also uh, euphoria, yeah. So euphoria and jealousy, and and uh, a, an interesting kind of uh, vicarious um, vicariousness in how it operates. So I was struggling a lot with coming to terms with um, with that word, and I think I should have just entitled my paper with um, whom I want to dedicate it, and this is Europa. So I start with a dedication. This lecture is dedicated to Europa, the mythic princess who in her dreams has two mothers, both of them fighting over her, and who is being saved from the claims of their jealousy through being abducted by Zeus, who carries her across the sea to a continent to which Europa brings along in a basket her fate, her destiny, not yet concluded, but curled up and perhaps asleep, at least given a rest, if only for the duration of the abduction. The myth is told by Moshos, one of the first known grammarians who lived in the second century in Syracuse. Europa's basket is one of the early instances of ekphrasis, an art especially reserved for the rhetorically well-versed poets because it involves a mimetic strategy that works not only in a double way, but also in a way that packages self-referentiality within itself. The poet has to describe an object in words by fabulating a situation in which the words can contain their own meaning in a manner that sets it free, that acknowledges this meaning's autonomy. But he also has to endow this object with liveliness by narrating the fabulation of the description within a vaster scope. A scope vaster than can be expected. In this vaster scope, the depicted elements of the fabula, the tableau with which the description is to work, can link up and make sense variously, pursue arbitrary directions. A fable is also called the story space of a lie or a ruse for this reason, or a story with a lesson, with a gift, something to be taken away from it after reading it. 
But how to think of that ideational space in which ekphrasis places its fabula? Is it, not, it is not that of geometry and its projection. It is also not that of a painting and its colored surfaces, lines and figures. At stake is an ideation that is sealess, entirely unoriginal, but full of ardor, devout, and yet in pursuit of something it cannot and does not hope to ever grasp in full. In our case of Europa and her basket, the poet places the fabula within the circuitous scope of a myth, which like all myths, must count as speech that captures what it presents in full, and that, because of the fullness of its speech, can never conclude itself in one particular ending nor one particular beginning. And yet, despite the fullness of mythic speech, ekphrasis has something to add to it, something that leaves the cycle, that steps out of its compass, a tale that does not stay put in the phrases of a mythic plot, a tale that seeks a certain amount of autonomy that wants to invert direction. This ideational space is not without reason, but, it, it, but its fabulations ask to be placed on the grounds of a reason that is best called abductive. This ode to Europa is written in praise of inhuet form, literally meaning form that has recently or just begun, form that commences. Such form has actuality too, but the time of its extension is not given. The actuality of inhuet form is given and it expands, but not its time. It literally lacks a place in time that would be proper to it. How to picture mentally the scope of such extension? Image loss. I quote, everywhere under the sun, the images were dying out. The main character in Peter Hanke's novel, Der Bildverlust, Image Loss, worries. We never learn this character's proper name throughout the story, even so it is her story that is being told in this novel. Her story is being told, so we learn, by somebody who has been contracted as its author for the curious reason that he has no particular interest in her, nor in the story itself, which he commits to writing. Such an odd choice of identifying an author is necessary, so we learn, because the story is to be told within the scope of a calculative reason. There is one sole and very particular purpose to the writing of this story, namely to make that very worry of hers, that everywhere under the sun the images were dying out, productive. The main character whose worry irrigates, or should we say inspires, the plot of the story, which she cannot tell, is the queen of finance. That's her profession, we learn. Finance literally means an end, settlement, retribution. It has come to mean the managing of money because the kind of ending at stake in finance is one where something that is due is being settled. The book by Handke is an attempt to depict an image of thought in the light but also in the force of reason's convertibility. This is what makes it interesting with regard to the promise of ekphrasis, namely fabulations that are placed on the grounds of abductive reason, phrasings that are capable of setting something free through adding to what is already full or whole and instead make it plentiful. If ekphrasis is capable of adding something to the fullness of mythical speech, so what fullness is Hanke's ekphrasis capable of adding something to? His object is not a basket, but a contract, a delivery contract for some author to write the story of the contractor, the person who literally places the story of her life in his hands. And this, so we learn, such that she, the key protagonist, might perhaps earn a place in her own story. Our protagonist does not want her own life, does not own, no, wait. Our 
protagonist does not own her own life, and yet she wants to give what is not, properly speaking, hers. The fullness of such a contract can add to, I want to suggest, is the fullness of ultimate capital. What it adds is the value of the priceless. Peter Hanke's novel, Der Bildverlust, is concerned with the scope of an extension that is unexpectedly vaster and whose action is expanding arduously, zealously. It is the story of the Queen of Finance, the story of an impersonated principle that reigns not only highest, but also with delight. A lofty and an aspiring principle that incorporates a reason that pursues an aim, namely to catch up with her own engenderings. Seelers ideation sources from the anonymous plenty, copia. It is copious ideation that is original not because of the ideas it, pic it pictures, but because it knows how to compose a firmament that can accommodate escalation by complementing it with a panoramic zodiac. Seelers ideation is ideation in fervent pursuit. The word comes from the Greek celos, meaning seal, a hot and corrosive spiritual motion that is concerned with placement and displacement. Jealousy shares the same etymological roots. In Eros the Bittersweet, Anne Carson, a poet, has characterized jealousy in two ways as a dance, in which either in the pursuit of erotic action, every person keeps moving restlessly, or <clears throat> a dance where erotic action is replaced with what Carson calls a ruse of heart and language, where dance is depicted as the motionless action of shifts in distances. In the action of this inverted dance, she says, the people do not move, desire moves, and eros is a verb, an action word. When Eros is an action word, Seelis ideation is ideation as a hot and corrosive spiritual motion. In, in pursuit of how to report an instance of Eros, an instance of its action that has no location. The images that play in their Bildverlust are images of a cosmic kind of erotic action. I quote from Handke, a single image mobilizing itself and her was all she needed, and the day would acquire a peaceful aura. These images, also devoid of human beings and happenings, had to do with love, with a love, a kind of love. And they had penetrated her since childhood. Some days fewer of them, some days whole swarms of these shooting stars, always taking the form of something she had actually experienced in passing, something completely sometimes completely absent, a non-day. And she was convinced that this happened to everybody, to a greater or lesser extent. No doubt, the specific image always belonged to the individual's personal world, but the image itself, as an image, was universal. It transcended him, her, it. By virtue of the open and opening image, people belonged together and the images did not impose anything, unlike every religion or doctrine of salvation." End of quote. I call these images of a cosmic kind of erotic action rendered into the setup of what Carson delightfully calls a ruse of heart and language, Meteora Alois. They are not telling the tales of love affairs, these images are not the images of a cosmogony. They depict Eros on the dance floor, Eros as an action word. They place him in a discrete kind of time that is neither properly historical, that is secular, nor an empty form of time like we have it in geometry. The idea of a compass made up of critical points in the sense of points beyond the possibility of return would kill the ekphrasic beauty, which is to find words that contain their own meaning in such a manner as to set it free. Hence, a critical horizon cannot accommodate the action in this ruse of heart and language. Crisis represents a chronological limit after the crossing of which the restoration of a balance is no longer possible. Such a compass would outline a closed boundary across which no rendering, no giving back, no restoration of depth is possible anymore. 
We need a figure of the horizon, hence, across which rendering, in our case, between what expands and the extension that is to accommodate this commencing expanse, is possible. We need the figure of a horizon that works like an image without being one, an image that sets free through capturing. We need an ekphrasis of the bounding circle, the description of its absent image in words that bring it before the mental eye of the reader vividly, endowed with affective force and with the quality of vivacity. We need the digitization of the horizon. We need a compass that is not only a hypothesis, but also a hypothec. We need a dialectics of mechanic resourcefulness, a dialectics that takes method and its negation into account. What can be the components of its tableau or fabula of such a digitized horizon. I have three proposals from which I will derive a list of concepts. The first component for this tableau of mechanic resourcefulness and sealess ideation, the first component is Vitruvius' book on technology, books 9 and 10. He begins the introduction to Book 9, which is a treatise on gnomons, on sundials, um, which is actually very generally a book on the use of science for architecture by recalling how the Greek ancestors appointed great honor to the athletes at the Olympic Games, how they were applauded and greeted in public and with great public expense. And he is astonished that the same kind of honor has not been bestowed to those whose, I quote Vitruv now, boundless services were performed for all times and all nations, end of quote. Those whose training not only strengthened their own bodies, but that of humankind in general. Namely, those are the people he names, Pythagoras, Democritus, Plato, Aristotle, Archimedes, Hero, all he says, men spent in constant industry, yielding fresh and rich fruit, not only for their own countrymen, but also to all nations." End of quote. And all of them, men whose, I, I quote him again, whose tender years are spent in plenteous learning, which this fruit affords. End of quote. Their knowledge, mentioned by Vitruvius mostly as knowledge in geometry, arithmetics, and mechanics, introduces civilized ways, impartial justice and law. He says, things without which no state can be sound. The examples he gives of the general resourcefulness of their insights all concern the counting, the keeping and the planning with time, according to mechanical processes. This becomes evident also in book 10, which is Vitruvius's treatise on machines. Here Vitruv writes, I quote him, all machinery is derived from nature and is founded on the teaching and instruction of the revolution of the firmament. Let us but consider the connected revolutions of the sun, the moon and the five planets, without the revolution of which, due to mechanisms, we should not have had the alternation of day and night, nor the ripening of fruits. Those, thus, when our ancestors had seen that this was so, they took their models from nature and by imitating them were led on by divine facts until they perfected the contrivances which are so serviceable in our lives. Some things with the, with the view to greater convenience, they worked out by means of machines and their revolutions, others by means of engines and so whatever they found to be useful for investigations, for the arts, and for established practices, they took care to improve step by step on scientific principles." End of quote. Okay. <laughs> At stake here is clearly a mimetic relation to nature, and it involves copiousness. Literally, the variation of constellations, of formulations, much in the same sense that Erasmus of Rotterdam, some 15 centuries later, astonished his contemporaries by giving more than 250 copious variations of a sentence, a simple, thank you for your letter. This was the sentence. The versions <coughs> expanded to lay... Uh, the, uh, so, so the versions he gives, uh, they were, he expanded them to laying eloquently 
using all of his available resourcefulness in terms of modulating emphasis by maximizing, minimizing, and tempering contrasts through playing with distances, angles, the use of comparatives, superlatives, and so on. Starting with, from my dear Faustus's letter, I derived much delight. He goes on with modulations of this sentence's content, as in, at your words a delight of no ordinary kind came over me, or I was singularly delighted by your epistle, or in these Faustine letters I found a wonderful kind of delectation, or to be sure how your letter delighted my spirits, and one more, your brief missive, your brief missive flooded me with inexpressible joy. <laughs> 250 of those. Erasmus is, is a great play in exuberance. The gifts in articulacy expressed by the list escalates to the point where in some of its instances he literally places the worth of his entire life purpose in the sender of this letter knowing that he is grateful for having received it. What kind of scope of extension are we dealing with here? Clearly, it is one where there is an efficacious convertibility between desire the wish to be made whole, and pleasure, an enjoyment in expenditure that is concerned with a making whole on a great variety of vaster or minor scales than one's own properly. It, <clears throat> is it really such a different one in kind than that of Vitruvius, where he claims with respect to mathematics and mechanics for architecture? Anne Carson, again, has a beautiful figure that captures well the point I wish to make. On the delight we take in metaphor, she says, I quote her, a meaning spins, remaining upright on an axis of normalcy, aligned with the conventions of connotation and denotation, and yet to spin is not normal, and to dissemble normal uprightness by means of this fantastic motion is impertinent. What is the relation of impertinence to the hope of understanding, to delight? The story concerns the reason why we love to fall in love. Beauty spins and the mind moves. To catch beauty would be to understand how that impertinent stability in vertigo is possible. But no, delight need not reach so far to be running breathlessly, but, yet, but, but, but not yet arrived is itself delightful, a suspended moment of living hope. End of quote. <clears throat> when asking about the scope of extension at stake with mechanical resourcefulness, our concern is not so much the demonstration and exposition of positive knowledge, but a kind of wonder about this peculiar relation between impertinence and form that also seeks delight and the hope of understanding nourished by delight itself. So let's hold on from this uh, component of our tableau to the figures of mechanical resourcefulness, mimesis that delights in copiousness, the relation between impertinence, delight, and hope for understanding. Yeah, for understanding. <laughs> the second component then for my tableau is Robert Grosteste's Treatise on Light. Grosteste was an English bishop writing in the 12th, 13th century. He was the teacher of Roger Bacon, to whom we owe, we owe the Novum Organum Scientiarum. Grosteste is the key figure whose intellectual legacy is continued to this day by the Oxford University. This is because Grosteste introduced an empirical setting for the pursuit of natural science, which he attributed experience, in which he attributed experience a central role. So not fact, experience, or stingers, um, facts, yeah. His achievement <coughs> was to come up with a model of cosmic nature in which experiment could yield demonstrative proofs, but the demonstrations would be related to the indefinite richness of experiences and how to make them shareable, communicable, rather than to substantiate the conformity between natural science and the doctrines of theology. His cosmic model of the natural world, the world below the firmament, managed to neither offend nor involve the theological institutions with and within this novel body of methods, as Bacon later called it, the Novum Organon, for science. 
His key stroke was to, was to treat a natural force as a mythological principle, namely light. All that exists naturally in the universe extends within the scope that encompasses light's instantaneous propagation in any direction and at once. Light speed. This may sound daring, but we still use light's speed to measure distances in today's astronomy too. The aspect of Seeler's ideation in Gross test consists in his separation of extension from dimension. It involves what I call mythological modeling. Extension is thought of by him as the domain in which the actuality of form exhausts itself. Form exhausts itself in an inward dynamics for Gross test, who was influenced among many others by Averroes' notion of a material intellect and by Pythagoras' ideas of a cosmos in spheres. In the outermost of Gross test's spheres, form is pure actuality. Whereas towards the innermost spheres of this mythological model, it gets more and more mixed up with potentiality and this with, with potentiality that is with an incomplete exhaustion of form's actuality. So the potential is if form is latent, no? is not exhausted. The Earth is at the core of this uh, mythological model of the universe, and here form is mixed up with the cyclical dynamics of generation and corruption of the four material elements, fire, earth, water, and air. Form, actuality, is literally what is rare here. And rarity is not the same like scarcity. The model, the beauty of this model is that it works with a principal abundance, a principal plenty of actuality. Rare is what does not realize itself cyclically. What involves form that steps out of the cycle, that erects. Form that aspires and seeks delight, elevation. According to this separation of actuality and potentiality, he also separated light from color, whereby the latter is tied up with potentiality and gives dimension, so color gives dimension, whereas light is tied up with actuality and gives extension. Gross test reacted thereby with great ingenuity to the doctrines on the intellect as a divine and immaterial and matter as fallen, dependent on being informed by the intellect. He related form to light as a physical force, not to a divine light of intellection directly. But it did also not rival <coughs> with divine light, for his model foresaw that the outermost sphere, where form has exhausted itself in pure actuality, it was divine intellect which imparted the energy for its sustenance. So it's an exhausted actuality which needs to be nourished from an outside, but this outside plays no significant role within everything that can be understood within. Like this, there is a model of impertinence across the spheres where intellect could still ultimately be considered divine, but where there was also a natural domain of light facilitating insight and understanding in reach for the human mind through the pursuit of natural science. In the methods of this pursuit of natural science, this facilitated was largely independent from theology, at least from any theology in particular. This model could accommodate an experimental practice in science that would not get in conflict with the churches so easily and so quickly. But it did not, of course, compete with theology with respect to the ultimate questions. This is precisely why I call, why I call it a world model crafted in Seeler's ideation. Like Vitruv, Grosstest appreciated the insights of geometry, arithmetics and mechanics, primarily for civic and political purposes. So not truth, if you want. So then, let's hold on to the following figures. The one that connects light with actuality and its instantaneous expanse that opens up time in a scalar scope of harmonics. Then the one that connects color with potentiality and dimensions, opening up nature as voluminous and spatial. And let's also hold on to the idea of rarity, the figure which relates demonstrations in geometry, in mathematics, to experience, not to ontology. And furthermore, let's keep for our tableau also the relation between actuality and impertinence. 
as facilitated by inchoet form. The third component I will need for my tableau is René Descartes' notion of the universe as a plenum with cracks. Strongly influenced by Gross Test's revolutionary treatise on light and on color, Descartes also accepted the instantaneity of light's propagation as a natural property of light. He too crafted a model of the universe with Seeless ideation. Yet not a mythological model like Gross Test, but an architectonic one, like Vitruv. His model of the universe now also aspired to systematize all that could be demonstrated of experience, that is of, of color, of dimensions, by relating the domain of color again to an empirically accessible nature of light. So this is why Gross Test was mythological. A, a, a nature of light um, wouldn't be there in Gross Test. Just the principality of it. In Gross Test, light was considered a physical force, but treated as a, met as a mythological principle, ultimately inaccessible to experiments. Descartes postulated that there is also a universal nature to light, which gives, he calls them divine laws of nature, and which is inaccessible, but there are also ordinary laws of nature that manifest in locally diverse effects. Descartes is very conscious about the model character of this approach. He begins his own treatise on light with a description of light, but he tells us that he will have to omit something from the description of this understanding of light. Namely, he will omit the true nature of light. The omission of saying anything about the true nature of light is why Descartes, like Kepler, speaks of a natural geometry. His geometry is to describe the nature of the ordinary laws, not the divine ones. The nature that geometry measures is the nature of light, and geometrical descriptions tell us about the order of the world and not a supposed order of universal nature itself. Descartes titled his book on natural philosophy, The World, not nature, The World. His interest was to empirically, access a to empirically access a study of the world of which he held ultimately that it can only be depicted as a fable. And the fable needs to tell the story of a world sculpted out of an abstract plenum. This is his architectonic model with which he wants to systematize all empirical knowledge. So this nature of light that he relates it back is, the, in my understanding, the plenum out of which he sculpts a reference frame for experiments that doesn't need to have um, uh, uh, the assumption of a, of a global, of a global um, uh, uniformity. <coughs> But it was the model of an, so it was um, sculpted out of an abstract plenum. This was his architectonic model with which he wanted to systematize all empirical knowledge. But it was the model of an imperfect, or rather a perfectible plenum, because it is plentiful, even plentiful with the absence of void. No? It has cracks, but these cracks are not empty, because they're always instantaneously, immediately being filled up. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's a plenty which accommodates the void through imagining the absence of the void. So if I, re if I remember correctly, what he says is that um, when God created the plenum, he made cracks from the beginning, but it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't play a significant role afterwards. It's just a kind of a ruse. This is what I would call a ruse. <coughs> So from the beginning, there are cracks in the plenum, whereby every crack is immediately being filled up, hence keeping the actuality of this plenum in incessant action, such that its action is turbulent and fluid in unordered manner. In, this, in his treatise on light, Descartes asks his readers to imagine a new world, of which he says, very easy to know, but nevertheless similar to ours. This is interesting. So easy to know, but nevertheless similar. Why is easy to know a contradiction to similarity? 
Okay, very easy to know, but nevertheless similar to ours, consisting of an indefinite space filled everywhere with real, perfectible, solid matter, divisible into, he says, as many parts and shapes as we can imagine. It is, form, it is from out of such a solid in action that his geometry can, from learning to instrument the ordinary nature of light, achieve descriptions of the world. But these descriptions are to be read with respect to them being the object of fabulation, an objective, an impersonal, a geometric kind of fabulation. Like with Ruf's architectonics, Descartes' architectonic, is me um, architectonic mechanistic worldview is one not in favor of determinism, but of indefinite resourcefulness and sealess ideation. So let's keep from Descartes, for our tableau, the following notion. The plenum and instrumentality, the relation between mechanicism and fabulation, the distinction between universal divine and ordinary worldly laws that facilitate experimental science. <coughs> keeping, that's the title of the next section, keeping the actuality of time in sealess ideation. And now, let's turn back to the initial metaphysical principle, the queen of finance in their Bildverlust. Here too, the images whose loss is being told are images of a sealess kind of ideation. They too need a scope of expansion where shifting distances can trigger a play of emplacement and displacement. I quote from Hanke, the image itself as a game in which an entirely different present is in effect than my personal one. The images play out in an impersonal present which is more, far more than mine and yours. They take place in the grander time of a single tense for which when I consider them, the images, the term present is not really appropriate. No, these images do not take place either in a grander or in a grand time, but in a time and in a tense for which no adjective and no name exists." End of quote. Images in a time and in a tense for which no adjectives, let alone a name, exists. Those are grammatical images. What I am after with this notion of sealess ideation are syntactical images in the architectonic scope of ekphrasis. This manner of depicting in words an absent image with lifeliness, a manner of a dialectic statement that sets its thesis free, that endows its thesis with autonomy. The forms of time in grammar are called tenses. My proposal breaks with that custom and instead maintains that the grammatical tenses are inquit forms of actuality, not of time. So they are not forms of time. Grammar keeps what it makes explicit in impertinent suspension. Grammar articulates an artificial kind of intelligence that is propelled by mechanic resourcefulness and sealess ideation. Let's look closer at what grammatical tenses do. Let's look at what they do for reading pure and simple, for a kind of reading that wants to report on the instances of actions of erots without foreclosing the scope of the efficacy of this action. This means to regard action as a magnitude of what I call sealess ideation. How to speak of this? Action taking place both externally and internally is intransitive, that means it's objectless, but it is entirely transformative action. This is how Handke characterizes the reading with which he hopes his readers will attend to his text. Handke writes, I quote, the story and the manner of its telling were calculated to make the future reader free to forget. From the moment they turned the first page, any thoughts they might have had of hunting for clues and sniffing around should be forgotten. If possible, the first sentence of a book would banish any such overt or ulterior motives in favor of reading, pure and simple." End of quote. At stake is action that characterizes reading pure and simple, not reading that would proceed by hunting for clues or sniffing around. 
The reader of this story cannot proceed analytically. She is not a detective. There is not a plot of an event already past that needs to be sorted out retrospectively and be put in the right light. The sole basis for her travel, which is the plot of the book, is actually an expedition. So the sole basis for her, for her expedition is one in the present continuous. Images are dying out everywhere under the sun. This is her plot, wherever she goes. It is the plot that needs to be put in the poetic meter of action as a magnitude. My last chapter is entitled Action as a Magnitude, Tenses as Inward Forms that Facilitate the Weathering of Situations. Through this interest in action as a magnitude, we are brought back to the problem of form and to that of eros as a verb. Among the early grammarians, especially with Varro, there was a dispute about how to think of the statues of nouns versus that of verbs. It is the case, is it the case that nouns somehow roll off, crystallize or condensate as an effect of verbs? Or is it rather the case that the corruptibility, the nature of all things that can be given names, trigger in a cyclic kind of activity of corruption and generation that is being captured by verbs? So are the nouns primary or are the verbs primary? Verbs need a timelessness, which we attribute to form. Grammar speaks of time forms when it distinguishes the tenses. But what is the content, what is the subject or the extension that verbs in the different tenses grasp? And our uh, uh, names for the time forms say verbs grasp perfectly. Yeah. Does present perfect, this would I guess be simple present in English, does present perfect is the vollendete Zeitform. It is the perfect form of time. It is the final form of time. It is a form that makes a present whole, that keeps a present intact. It keeps it as a concluded activity. But the deficient tense, what in German is called das Imperfekt, does not make such a present that can be kept perfectly in any way deficient or less. The imperfect tense is also called das Preteritum, that which passes by. Austrian German calls it, beautifully so, die Mitvergangenheit, the past that goes along. It is the form of a tense that adds memory to an intact present. It facilitates for the, di for the discretion of one present from another. It too is a form, a grammatical form. Grammar is insightful in a deep, in an absurd kind of way. Absurd literally means that which sounds from the bottom from a base that is unfathomably deep, some say lost. Grammatical forms capture the lost base of actuality. From it springs the growing scope of extension, of space. Grammatical forms are inhortive, inhort. This word means that they are always just commencing. They are unfolded, drawn out of, rested from a bottom that is deeper than can ever be reached. This is to say, that the inward forms of tenses self-engender themselves. We could say here, their forms are forms sub specie absurditas, rather than sub specie eternitas. In the light of absurdity, rather than in the light of eternity. Next to the perfect tense and the imperfect tense, most languages also know what in German is called das Plusquam perfect. A tense that opens up memory to all it does not cover. We use it for indicating with respect to a past event that there was something happening before this event, something that is not entirely captured by lifting this one event, however imperfectly, up towards its absurd actuality in the ideally perfect tense, that of the present perfect. The grammatical forms of tenses make room for events to happen, to take place. For example, I am thinking, doppelpunkt, <laughs> it was raining when I realized that I have actually grown one day older today. 
combination of the tenses. The names <coughs> for tenses vary across the languages. The English language distinguishes a simple present and a present progressive or a present continuous for what in German we call as present. Similarly, it speaks of a simple as well as a continuous or a progressive past for what we call as plusquamperfect. It says a past perfect. Regardless of differences like these, the grammatical tenses render time in various scales of perfection, all of them cyclical and impertinent, open and leaking with respect to each other. Grammatical form for time gives time a quality of tenseness, which comes from Latin tendere, for to stretch or to extend. <clears throat> Grammar has learned to think of this stretching cyclically through scales of perfection. Verbs are action verbs, Ver verbs are action words, but what actually do they do to action? If action can be simply or, perfect or perfectly present, as well as future or past, progressively or continuously, then how can we think the delimitation and qualification of action in adverbial terms that index recycling and sustainability? Weathering is a verb not used very often, but it is also not my own invention here. Weathering as a verb, it colloquially means coming through safely, as when a ship makes it out of a storm. Weather as a noun is in irreducibly linked to notions of time. As the etymological dictionaries tell us, Greek had words for good weather and words for storm and for winter, but no generic word for weather until Kairos, as a term for time, literally uh, uh, began to be used um, in Byzantine times. Latin tempestas means weather and also time. And words for time also come to mean weather in Irish, in Serbo-Croatian, in Polish, in many languages. The weather is perhaps the only thing of which it is acceptable to say that it is given in plenty. Abundantly so, and ubiquitously so, all over the earth. What fascinates me ever since I read Der Bildverlust, actually I'm still reading it, I haven't read it completely, is that we might perhaps have to learn to think of images like this. Images are like the weather. They too are given in plenty and they form an immaterial kind of magma. We can, can, we, <coughs> can we imagine an architectonics of ekphrasis as an architectonics of the weather? Action as a magnitude, power, if you want, is a magnitude that does not leave unaffected whoever attempts to either negate or to affirm it. It affects whoever attempts to make the magnitude of action work for oneself or to keep oneself free from it. If ut sub specie absurditas, its promise is nothing more and nothing less than the possibility of finding safe passage through whatever time might bring. It is reason for hope that any situation at all can but might not be weathered. What such an architectonics would render would give back to who credits its assumptions so daringly, so zealously, is to render her capable of talking about the experience of time before the background and while being in touch contingently with the real presence of actuality and its forms of contemporariness. Let's recall now what we collected from the tableau and its three components, Vitruvius's civic scope of mechanic resourcefulness, Erasmus's place in exuberance, in exploration of copious escalation and containment of the plenty, Grosteste's mythological model of light as a physical force, and Descartes' architectonic of the universe, which treats the nature of light as a metaphysical principle whose true nature escapes what can be understood in science. We collected a bundle of notions from each of them and concluding, I would like to suggest thinking of those no with those notions in the pursuit of what they might do to the grammatical tenses as we know them. How can they delimit and qualify? How can they help us to articulate those tenses as inward forms of a magma between actuality and perfection? The notions are 
mechanical resourcefulness, mimesis that is not concerned with originality but delights in copiousness. The relation between impertinence, delight, and hope for understanding. Then we had connecting the physics of light with real actuality and with intellectual resourcefulness. Then we had the scope of light's expanse of an instantaneous propagation in all direction as a kind of copia, a plentiful noisiness. Then we had time's actuality rendered in the scalar scopes of harmonics and impertinence. Furthermore, time's actuality as being of form but lacking dimensions. Then we had connecting color with potentiality, material resourcefulness and dimensionality. And relating demonstrations in geometry, mathematics to experience, not ontology. Then we had rarity as the actuality of form in so far as it reaches beyond a natural compass that is given to it. Then we had the universe as an architectonic plenum. We had the relation between a mechanistic worldview and geometry that counts as natural. We had the relation between fabulation, mechanis mechanicism and subjectivity. And we had the distinction between universal, divine and ordinary worldly laws. I dedicated this talk to Europa, the mythic princess who on the grounds of abductive reason carries her destiny along wherever she goes, careful but without thinking about it, in a golden basket that is a family talisman rendered as an ekphrasis. All she seeks is to escape the jealous claims of her two mothers, mother tongue and the muse in poetic voice, perhaps. Let's sing songs with sealess ideation instead in praise of her adventures and let's celebrate Moshos, this early grammarian who knew how to describe an absent object in words by fabulating a situation in which the words grow capable of containing their own meaning in a manner that sets it free, that endows it with autonomy. Let's exercise literacy in coding by learning about each other in the delightful ruses of heart and language. Let's follow the brave adventurer, whoever Europa might be, on her trips through a cosmic kind of weather made up of factuality and impertinence, facilitated by inchoate form and going on fabulously so since ever. This, I imagine, is what digital images are all about. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Zavera. Questions? Wonderful stuff. Um, uh, and where to start, really? <laughs> I, suppo all, all, I suppose all I really want to do is that you is to tell you that you um, have explained to me uh, that that um, I, w the, the work that I've been doing. Uh, over the last couple of years, is really about an, an impertinent universe, um, w w which I'll elaborate. Um, the, there is a, uh, so the, uh, the starting point perhaps might be with, with Whitehead, um, and it's to do with this, um, uh, what he calls epochs of the universe, um, whereby uh, he imagines the same kind of baroque exhaustion of form, this kind of impertinent uh, uh, drive to exhaust form that, that, that is um, in operation in, in the universe, um, but that does not um, ultimately exhaust itself. What it does is recast in a, in a new epoch. And he wants to say this really in, in very um, contemporaneously, well, <laughs> He makes connections with, with, with contemporary science. He says that there are electronic societies, there are protonic societies, and that mm. in, in the course of an epoch, one of these electromagnetic uh, societies, for instance, this is ours, wow. will rise to dominance, but will fade into the background. And that over the course uh, of, 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 of time, um, the, the, the very structuration of structuration will ultimately change. 
Um, and that, that it's that that constitutes the, um, the move from one epoch to another. So um, he, uh, uh, while he does use those words, what, what he wants to stress is that um, these are not timeless, enduring natural kinds, natural entities, and that there may be a time when the proton will no longer exist, but new forms of material energetic structuration will, will come to be. That we have no idea, we have no image for that. Um, uh, but, but we have a good sense that that, that may well happen. Um, and also perhaps it might be useful to, to talk a little bit about um, um, the, uh, our, our contemporary cosmology, and in particular um, Lee Smolin, and in particular a, 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 book, a collaboration um, he uh, had with uh, a, a philosopher called Roberto <laughs> Ungar, who talk about the, the sort of um, the priority of time before law, um, and that uh, and the possibility of law, the very structuration of law changing. Uh, they say, for instance, that we can't really um, plausibly speak of the laws that we find in our cooled down universe applying from the very start. We have no idea really about how the laws applied before nucleosynthesis in, in stars. Um, and really they're telling the, the same story of, of, a, of a, an evolving universe, an impertinent universe that is capable of this ekphrasis that, that, that you describe. Yeah, but for me it's very important that it's precisely not about evolution. So ekphrasis involves cuts. It's not a reproduction that, uh, that includes transformation. And <coughs> it's also about fabulation and ideation. I'm not doing ontology, I keep telling you. <laughs> not ontology, not epistemology. The questions okay, where, where forms have no eternity, they're you. only important if you're an epistemologist. So there is regularity, there is all of these things. We can speak of form and we don't need to claim anything. If we go, instead of trying to reduce, we expand and try to find what we can make of it. This is what I want to do. But I didn't know that Whitehead was, that it is beautiful, I need to look it up. Absolutely. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> <But do> <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> There is a dialogue there, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not convinced, we'll, we'll maybe talk more. <laughs> uh, thank you for this perfectly gigantic presentation. <laughs> I, it's like hearing the history of the world in 45 minutes. Uh, I have three very small comments to make that uh, really don't even require a reply, but you may find them useful. In the, the section you uh, identified as your last section on grammar, uh, you might find it helpful to consider starting with uh, a theory you don't want to embrace, which is Aristotle and the categories. Aristotle dismisses verbal clauses completely, identifying what we predicate of versus predicating in a subject as he's searching for primary being, primary usia. Primary usia is neither predicated of nor predicated in. It's always the logical subject. And predicated of is always species and genus relation, whereas predicated in is Socrates is white. Uh, Socrates, you can understand without him being white but you can't understand him without being man. And that's a, a kind of a traditional story for which you're going in a different direction. It, it, it might, might be a helpful... No, no, I had a first version of the paper had a, I mean, there is this notion in Aristotle, so it's the same, like, so th th the reservations you're mentioning, pr they, they pertain basically ontology, so the, the, the primary usia, which is not my concern. But there is this notion of the commensurate universals in Aristotle, which is precisely a way of how to address the middle term in what I call a weathering kind of manner. Yeah? So, so, and this I'm very interested in, because it's a, the, con the uh, uh, commensurate universals are terms which, as I understand, has mainly been used in, on the one hand in geometry and on the other hand in his treatise on the weather, in the Meteora. And uh, in, so perhaps to get an idea of what it is in geometry, it means um, when, we, when we say, an, um, um, I don't know, a right angled triangle, so 
I forgot now what is. When you have different kinds of triangles and there is a property of being right angled, it is important that we attribute this property to the proper level of general reference to triangles. So if we would attribute this property to a specific one to which it applies also, we make a difficult kind of mistake. It's not properly a category mistake, it's strange. Yeah? So it's important that the levels of generality in how we attribute properties is adequate. And um, in, uh, with regard to, uh, to the weather, this way of uh, assuming a middle term um, makes it possible to, to, think, to think about things which don't really have a form, like uh, rainbows, like clouds, like things which, 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 which come out of cyclic, uh, of, cy of polar and cyclic dynamics. Like all the, so one question that he wrote about, for example, is why is it that uh, the water in the seas is salty and that in lakes is not salty? If we must assume that there is a kind of a cycle of evaporation and of condensation that all the water on the planet is involved in. So then this term of the commensurate universal helped him to, be, to begin to understand uh, and to describe phenomena of weather in a way which wouldn't properly be ontological, but it was experience related. Yeah? So with this term, I'm, this is my plan. I want to work with that. Yeah. Second point. I, it may be useful or as another example to uh, call on the Greek word to know in the ancient language, it's in the perfect. To know is oida, uh, to have seen. It may be a useful point. Say again? In the ancient language, you don't say I know something, you say oida, I have seen. To know is to already have seen. It seems ah, like it fit very much in, and it's just not any perfect, it's the perfect for knowing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the next small point is that weathering um, is a gerund. It, it's, it's not a verb. We weather a storm <laughs> as a verb, but it's a verbal noun. As you began <laughs> to say that, I began to think about grammar, and that's what led me back to Aristotle, so I, I was in a loop there. Um, and my last point is um, I got sidetracked at the beginning of your talk when you said zealous, and then you said you were sort of ambiguous about it because you heard the word jealous, y you weren't sure. No, now, I it's am sure. true that in the ancient myths of Helen, she was on one case raped and stolen. On the other case, she was bored with Menelaus, so she packed her own things. And in the third case, she was in Egypt. She wasn't even part of this. So it's not like a right or wrong story. But there's another aeropé that comes before the one you look at, which means we follow not the brave adventuress, but the brave adulteress. And she is the wife of Atreus. So as Tantalus has his boy Pelops, from whom we have the Peloponnesus, he has two boys, Atreus and Thyestes, who when he passes are full of brotherly love, if you'll pardon my sarcasm. Uh, each one wants to have the whole land. And Atreus uh, has as his wife, Aerope. They know that whoever owns the golden lamb is the one, the golden ram is the one entitled to rule. Theestes doesn't have it. He makes a deal with uh, Aerope, your Europe, which is if she'll give him the ram, he will agree to sleep with her. It's a remarkable story and that's how he initially becomes king, only to find out when Atreus figures this out and has Zeus intercede, she gets killed. So it, I don't know if it's also part of the jealousy moment uh, that was in both, but it's, it's part of another Aeropé story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have to say that we are a bit delayed and running <laughs> in danger yes, of- Yes, we should go uh, for lunch. Losing the reservation, but maybe uh, one question. It's, it's a quick question, and it sort of um, is related to the, the last one um, because of this sort of observation about the relationship of zealous to jealousy. Um, it made me think about um, the introduction that you gave to this conference around the relation of sof uh, sophistication to having some sense. I think I remembered you saying that there's some um, aspect of it that also has to do with adultery. 
And so I, I was curious about <laughs> placing then this notion of zealous ideations yeah, yeah. within a logic of sophistication. Yeah, of course, um, because it is sophistication which is um, uh, in its etymology has adultery. So to say a sophist something is sophisticated means it's adulterated from a purity that one would attribute it. So that's again, the sophistication is with the weather. You only have mixes, no? And the, ad and the, and the, um, the adultery is then also interesting because of course it has uh, a, a ma maturity in it, no? With, with sophistication. So there is a level of mundigkeit, again, perhaps to, to, be, to be found there, I don't know. No, it is. It's, it's the one I needed to become friends with. It was just not so easy. <laughs> yeah. Now, and I, I mean, obviously, you know, if, there is, if, if eros is a verb, there must be a counterpole. So there must be something else uh, that, 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 yeah, so, it, no.